All right, thanks everyone at uh, Cambridge uh, for the invitation. I, I hope that uh, in future symposia, I can be there in person. I actually, I, I spent a year of my training as a physicist um, at Cambridge at the Cavendish and I'd, I'd love to go back and see the LMB. Um, so uh, RNA molecules over the last few years have become superstars of uh, biology and biotechnology. Uh, RNA is on the cover of popular magazines for its roles in the early stages of life as shown here, um, and also for its potential roles in the future of life in the form of uh, guide molecules for complexes like the CRISPR-Cas9 machine that we just heard about from, from Julia. In medicine, first-in-class treatments for diseases like uh, childhood spinal muscular atrophy um, have arisen um, uh, thanks to strategies that directly target RNAs in our bodies. And there are now even medicines that are themselves made of RNA and probably the most famous examples are the COVID mRNA vaccines that many of us have received. Beyond its growing roles in biotechnology and medicine, RNA uh, research into biology, into natural RNAs, has also been exploding. Um, and uh, we're now seeing um, uh, uh, a large number of new classes of RNAs that are being discovered in nature. One of my favorite examples are these so-called riboswitches, um, which somehow fold up into complex folds that recognize small molecules, and these RNAs then can turn on or turn off gene expression. These RNAs are pervasive in uh, bacteria, and they appear to also be present in eukaryotes. And perhaps in the form of protein sensing ribos, which is they may be pervasive in eukaryotes as well. Um, as additional examples of functional RNA elements, it turns out it seems possible that viruses are chock full of, of these RNA elements as well. I'm showing you a little diagram of one called a frame shift stimulation element that will reappear in my talk. Now, for all of these RNA molecules, we actually have a pretty reasonable and complete lists of the RNA sequences that might carry out these functions. And in many cases, we can sketch out these so-called secondary structures, uh, which are these Watson Crick Franklin base pairing patterns that I'm showing on, on this slide. But in only a few privileged cases, um, such as the, the CRISPR RNA that we just uh, that we just saw, do we have a picture in three dimensions of how these RNAs work? And without such pictures, we may be missing out on a um, a deep and hidden and perhaps um, a large dimension to biology. And uh, one reason for that may be that RNAs don't form really interesting three dimensional structures. But a few of us have harbored hopes that perhaps. Uh, 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 a large number of RNAs have such structures. And so a question that's been driving me for a long time um, is, um, and remains unanswered is, are there well-defined 3D RNA structures everywhere? And I'm gonna start here with the use case, um, probably one of the most famous and most now most studied RNAs um, in history, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA genome. So by about February of 2020, when a novel coronavirus looked like it was gonna become a pandemic around the world. Um, many labs, RNA labs, including mine, um, and I can't get a pointer here, let me see. Okay, I'll have to do this without a pointer. Many labs, including mine, um, uh, started looking at the genome and con conservation and noted that a, a good quarter of it looked highly conserved across the coronaviruses. Those are these kind of cyan segments up there at the top of the, the genome. And that, along with decades of coronavirus genetics, previous coronavirus genetics, indicated that there should be high, there might be highly conserved critical RNA secondary structures, uh, uh, RNAs that perform well-defined Watson-Crick-Franklin base pairing patterns. And by March or April of 2020, many labs had carried out computer modeling and chemical mapping uh, procedures that indicated that there are pervasive secondary structures throughout the SARS coronavirus 2 genome. And I'm showing here on the right, a couple of examples of these, uh, these uh, secondary structure diagrams from my lab and other labs. I do wanna emphasize that there was probably a dozen or maybe two dozen groups who have uh, reached a consensus that there's, there's this extensive secondary structure. But our lab quickly moved on to a different question. Um, we were curious to see if any of these um, secondary structures corresponded to well-defined three-dimensional structures of RNAs, we reasoned that those kinds of tertiary structures would lead to potentially important biological insights based on homology to other viral RNA segments. And we also uh, wondered whether those three-dimensional structures um, 
could guide the uh, design of drugs, small molecule drugs that might target um, pockets and holes in those, in those 3D structures. Now, for a long time, since I was a graduate student, um, uh, I hoped for a procedure that would let us take a long sequence, uh, like what I'm showing here, and to rapidly, in the time scale of days or maybe even hours, to figure out whether it has well-defined three-dimensional structures, and if so, what are those structures? This is very much the analog of the protein structure prediction problem that John uh, told us about in detail. And actually, over the last, let's say, five or 10 years, uh, my lab and the RNA structure prediction community has made steady progress to the point where in blind structure prediction contests called the RNA puzzles, uh, we and others have made um, models uh, uh, true blind predictions of these riboswitches, small molecule sensing riboswitches, um, where the global folds routinely um, are accurate when compared to crystal structures that were solved uh, separately and then released after the structure prediction trials. Um, and uh, more recently, um, through the advent of deep learning approaches, it looks like some of these um, predictions are, are getting to the point where they're nearly indistinguishable from, from the uh, crystal structures. However, there's still a gap between computation and reality. And uh, one way I can illustrate that is by saying that uh, these predictions that I'm showing you here that look reasonably accurate at the global level um, are one of 10 predictions. And typically they were kind of down number four or number eight on the list. And, uh, uh, and so we're very far from being able to actually select out uh, the, the, the accurate structures from pools of, of, of models. And then secondly, if I showed you all the atoms in these models and zoomed in on, for example, the ligand binding sites, um, you would see that these are not atomically accurate at the level of, say, an alpha fold uh, for, for proteins. Um, so uh, this um, looked like it was getting potentially um, stuck. And starting um, about uh, four years ago, um, uh, people in my group started wondering, could we bring to bear cryo-electron microscopy on this problem? So we, uh, we all know about the power of cryo-EM for looking at RNA protein structures, such as CRISPR-Cas9 complexes in the ribosome. And of course, we've seen cryo-EM revolutionize the study of protein-protein complexes, but that actually never been applied to RNA structures in this size range, um, or actually really to any RNA-only structures. Um, so uh, we were fortunate around that time um, uh, to have Wa Chu uh, moved to Stanford um, from, from Baylor. And it turns out that he is a, uh, is a closet RNA aficionado. And so when my group approached him about um, targeting RNA structures, he said, okay, well, let's try them all. And so we drew up a list of, in this case, a kind of a, a 19 RNA wish list of RNAs in, um, uh, uh, in different states. And I'll tell you what these, some of these are in, in, in a minute, but suffice to say that uh, these RNAs really covered every class of what we thought might be interesting RNAs of unknown structure. So in red here are a bunch of RNA enzymes or ribozymes. In blue are a, bunch, uh, a few of these riboswitch aptomers, which uh, appear to sense small molecules. Uh, we tried to solve them with and without their target ligand. Um, in green are some synthetic RNA nanostructures uh, that we and others have been trying to design. And in gray are some negative controls. So these are RNAs where uh, the field had evidence that they wouldn't form a well-defined 3D structure unless they bound protein partners. Um, and in some cases, they would form actually a, a, a heterogeneous ensemble of secondary structures. And one of the wonderful things about RNAs is that they're actually relatively easy to prepare. You can sort of on a time scale of a day uh, um, make almost any RNA sequence um, uh, if it's under a, a couple hundred nucleotides. And um, prepared those, shall purify them. And I should say here, this is an amazing collaboration that involved Callie Capel in my lab doing all the biochemistry, um, and then Zhao Ming Su and uh, Kai Ming Zhang in, in Wa Chu's lab. And so the three of them got together, started uh, preparing the RNA, they put them on grids, and we were elated to find that uh, the majority of these um, actually formed well defined maps. So that some of the negative controls that we didn't think would form a structure produce two-dimensional class averages. Unfortunately, I can't point here, um, uh, uh, which showed disconnected density, and we didn't carry those further. But the majority of these, uh, of the ones where we hope to look at the fine structure, gave resolvable maps. Now, the resolution of these maps were not atomic resolution. They were sort of in the range of 4 to 12 angstroms. But these were clearly 
RNA maps. Like they had sausage-like densities, which had the right dimensions to be the A-form helices um, that always recur in RNA structure. And in many, uh, in most of these cases, the resolution got to the point where we could make out major and minor grooves. Let me see if I can get the, um, the pointer to show up. Okay, somehow my Zoom settings aren't allowing it. Okay, but in many of these cases, you might, for example, look at the very top left structure here. You can make out these grooves that are twirling around the sausages, and those are hallmarks of these A-form double helices. Even at just the level of these maps at this medium resolution, um, we could start getting some kind of uh, functional insights. So as an example, every riboswitch switch that we looked at, uh, like this glycine riboswitch, switch, when we solved, try to solve it with and without ligand, we found that the RNA has a pre-organized tertiary structure. That is the APO and HOLO states uh, look identical, at least at the resolution that we're resolving here. That was true for glycine ribos, which is from multiple organisms, a ribos which that binds and recognizes s methionine. As well as in this case, this is a synthetic riboswitch where we took a very small aptamer that had been selected for ATP and AMP. We had tried to uh, uh, stabilize it within a larger nanostructure, and we were uh, uh, pleased to see that, uh, as we had hoped for, this RNA is stabilized with, uh, without even without its ligand into a well-defined pre-organized tertiary structure. But we reasoned that to get even more insight, we really want to get coordinates to fit into these maps. And... Um, uh, at least at, at this resolution, it's a very tedious and in some cases impossible activity to, to trace the RNAs and uh, to trace RNA coordinates uh, into these maps. Um, so uh, we decided to bring to bear two other technologies that we've been developing in parallel uh, with, um, with, with cryoEM. One uh, involves trying, well, it's kind of clear there are some helices in these maps, but if you had a list of the helices based on the sequence, you would at least uh, know how to which um, you would have a list of which TLCs you'd want to try to fit into the maps. And uh, we had developed a technology based on chemical mapping approaches. I won't have too much time to explain this one in the detail, right out through next generation sequencing that we call the mutated map or M2Seq approach. Um, very quickly, at least for the RNA aficionados, it's this neat way where you, you make not just your RNA of interest, but you make every mutant of it using airborne PCR and then use, use chemical mapping to figure out the accessibility of each nucleotide. And then um, what I'm showing you here are profiles as you go down the um, RNA, and you look to see if you make a mutation, for example, at residue 10 of the RNA, do you then see a residue 120 pop out? That's a signature that they might be base paired. So these kinds of uh, mutated map experiments then give these intricate patterns where even often by eye, you can just make out um, signatures for the base pair, also quick Franklin base pairs, and then make out the secondary structures of the RNAs. Um, and of course, we also have automated methods that just take these data and spit out the secondary structure. Now, once you have a list of these Watson Crick Franklin helices, you have to get them docked into the map. And ideally, you want to do that in an automated and unbiased way. Uh, so we've developed approaches using Rosetta. Um, these are not deep learning approaches yet because uh, when we developed them, we didn't have uh, uh, deep learning versions of, of Rosetta. Um, but I won't have time to describe this in too much detail, but they're basically using um, uh, de novo fragment assembly methods for RNA structure prediction. And they've now been adapted to fit in helices and then build all the intervening loops. And based on the convergence of these kinds of fitting methods, we can also estimate the accuracies of the models. And we brought together in this method, the backronym is Drafter which stands for de novo RNA or ribonucleoprotein protein modeling in real space through assembly of fragments together with experimental density in Rosetta, actually draft we had developed previously to help model in RNAs into RNA protein machines like, like CRISPR-Cas9 and ribosomes and, and other ribonucleoprotein protein machines here we adapted it uh, to what turned out to be a harder problem, modeling RNA into maps where you don't have protein landmarks. Or bringing together those cryo maps, the M2Seq biochemical method to get secondary structure and this um, auto-drafter method we created a pipeline that we then uh, dubbed the Ribozolve pipeline. And we were uh, excited to see that we could uh, then take the data we had in hand and visualize 3D coordinates of these RNAs um, for many of these RNAs. And so I'll just tell you about some of these. The first one is going to be the tetrahymena ribozyme. This is the first RNA enzyme ever discovered. It won Tom Tchek and Nobel Prize. Um, after 40 years, its structure could not be solved by crystallography or NMR, its global structure. And here, you know, with cryo-EM, uh, after a few days, we were able to resolve its, its structure. What I'm showing here are structures of something called the HC16 ligase. 
Jerry Joyce and others have been trying to uh, find an RNA that might replicate itself to mimic what happened in the, in, at the origins of life. They had evolved this RNA from the tetrahymenal ribosome, and we assume it would have the same shape as the tetrahymenal ribosome, but it turns out it has a totally rewired active site. What I'm showing here is are these ribose aftermers, this one from cholera, um, and it binds uh, glycine. And here the uh, coordinates verify that this RNA has the same global fold, even with and, both with and without the ligand. And here is a uh, ribose that binds glycine from, from the bacterium epinucleatum. Here, the coordinates again verify the free organized structure, but also verify the homology between those um, glycine ribosurges across bacteria. This is an RNA that, that I mentioned that we designed to stabilize an ATP binding aptomer. And here, having the coordinates let us verify that our predicted structure matched the actual experimental structure, again, within the resolution of the cryo-EM. And this is a ribosurge that binds S-adenosylmethionine, then predicted to have its core as overlaying um, a, another class of SAM riboswitch, while the rest of the RNA had a, has rewired tertiary contacts. And again, here the cryo in a very unbiased way verified those predictions. Um, the SAM riboswitch actually got to a resolution nearing about uh, getting close to four angstroms. Um, uh, and uh, Kai Ming Zhang um, took that as a signal to then get a huge number of micrographs and was able to push the resolution down to uh, basically four four angstroms here, 4.1 angstroms. And this led us to something that we had never seen before with RNA cryo-EM. Um, we tried to look for the ligand that was bound to the structure. So on the left here is the, uh, the cryo-EM map. Um, on the right is a simulated map from the um, draft for modeled RNA. If you subtract uh, these two maps, you get a difference map. It's a bit noisy, but uh, there's a blob right in the middle, and that corresponds exactly to where we expect the acetylmethionine to bind. Um, and so, of course, this is an atomic resolution, but it's hinting that cryo may be useful for efforts, for nascent efforts by academics and by industry to try to target small molecule drugs into the binding pockets of RNAs. And it's been really encouraging to see in the last few months that some structures, uh, for example, from the Anderson's lab, um, are able to, again, resolve uh, densities for small molecules in RNA-only structures. Um, uh, I do want to emphasize that the, the resolution here, you'd love for it to be atomic resolution, and we and others are pushing on the resolution. So as an example, the tetrahymenal ribozyme, our first maps were at six angstrom resolution. Last year, we published um, a 3.1 angstrom resolution map, and actually at, on the same day, we published that um, uh, a group at, at Harvard um, published a 3.0 angstrom resolution map of the same molecule, which, which agreed um, essentially perfectly. Um, and uh, this is a resolution at which you can, for example, start to see metal ions that we know are important for catalysis and folding of the RNA. And it looks like we're going to being able to push this even further and further with improvements to microscope technology. So stay tuned for that in the next couple of months. We hope to put out that, that story. Um, so it does seem like RNA cardium can potentially even get to the near atomic resolution that we see for the very, very best protein and ribosome uh, cryo-EM structures. Um, but I want to take it back to the, the pandemic and the coronavirus genome. Um, in starting in February of 2020, we decided to uh, take this ribosome pipeline, which at that, that point had just been um, uh, uh, developed and, uh, and uh, described in a preprint, and we started to steer it towards. We decided to steer it towards windows of the SARS coronavirus two genome, and uh, we um, actually. Uh, struck gold unexpectedly on the first molecule that we tried. Right? And this is the molecule where um, called this frame shift stimulation element. And um, this is a secondary structure model that uh, was developed by our group as well as Jonathan Dinman's group very early on in the pandemic. Um, it's proposed, it was proposed to be a control module for viral protein expression. And um, the way this works is at least in other coronaviruses, the analogous segment um, uh, tricks the ribosome into pausing and then um, slipping back by one nucleotide on what's called a slippery site, a kind of repeat site. Um, and you know it's got to be important because it's nearly perfectly conserved between SARS coronavirus 1 and SARS coronavirus 2. So in this 88 nucleotide segment, there's only one, one nucleotide that changed between the two viruses. But we figured it was going to be a no-go for cryo-EM because um, uh, a, it's uh, we expect it to be heterogeneous. So the SARS coronavirus one frame shift stimulation element had not been solvable by cryo-EM cryo or by NMR um, after 15 years. 
And also it's small. So the uh, 88 nucleotides of an RNA corresponds to uh, 28 kilodaltons in size. So that's you know uh, more than a factor of three below, at least what we were using as a rule of thumb for what you could image by cryo EM. You know, about 100 kilodaltons is what we, we assumed you could, uh, is the smallest you could resolve. But we tried it, um, put it on grids, and we were really excited when we started to see these two-dimensional class averages. You can make out that there's a shape. It's, it's, these look like different views of something that looks like uh, a Y or a wishbone. Uh, we started to call it, it looks like the Greek letter lambda, so we called this a lambda-like bulb. Um, and these 2D class averages start, start to show detail. Again, not at atomic resolution, but at a point where you could potentially start to see major and minor groups. So we've got enough micro gaps that would let us get a 3D reconstruction. And that's what I'm showing here. And so, so first of all, even just at the map level, you can see there are these really tantalizing holes and grooves, which um, might end up becoming small molecule binding sites to guide drug design. But uh, the really most interesting insights we got were, were when we actually um, uses autodrafter to get coordinates into this map. So I'm going to show you that. Here's a picture of the uh, this FSC or frame shift stimulation element fold. One salient feature is that even though it's a very small RNA, most of it forms this, this kind of lasso. And then the fiber man shown in green appears to thread through it. So I'm going to show this one more time. So here's this 88 nucleotide RNA fold. It has a three helix fold. Okay, Most of it is forming this, um, this lasso with the hole in the middle and the five uh threads through. And this gave us a hint um, as to function, which I'll describe next. So first of all, I want to emphasize that this is a, a new fold. Um, and this is um, uh, one that uh, uh, it doesn't match anything else in the database uh, to our knowledge. Um, it roughly matches some computational predictions that uh, my lab and Michael Woodside's lab had made. Um, most interestingly, it provides a three-dimensional view of a mechanism that had been proposed 15 years previously by Jonathan Dinner's lab. They called it a torsional restraint mechanism. So let me tell you how that works. So again, I can't point, but if you imagine in, this, in the middle panel here, that that's supposed to be a ribosome chugging along the virus genome, it gets to this fold, where, which is almost like a knot, right? That 5 m is threaded through a ring. And when it gets there, you can imagine that, uh, this is proposed by the Dinan Din lab for SARS-CoV-1, the ribosome will have to pause, uh, either to wait for the knot to un unfold itself or to somehow apply enough, some sort of energy or push a transition that will unfold the knot and let it keep reading through the RNA. And the idea is that during that time, which might be seconds or minutes, then the ribosome will have a, a, a window of time where it'll slip back on the so-called slippery site. This kind of a mechanism where a machine is paused on a knotted RNA had been proposed in a very different system, a flavivirus system, um, uh, which um, has a, uh, uh, in, um, like in, in dengue, uh, dengue virus RNAs and the Zika virus. Jeff Keith's lab had shown that there's a, uh, those RNAs prevent degradation by another machine called the uh, uh, 503 prime exonuclease XRN1. Um, by forming a knot that is hard to unfold by that exonuclease. Uh, but it's a different machine and actually it's a different, it's a different knotted fold. But there appears to be some, maybe some functional homology there. Another twist to the story is around the same time, uh, our lab and several other labs did chemical mapping of this RNA in vivo, or at least in, in infected cells. And they seem to show that the, uh, that the RNA genome does not form this three helix quasi knot fold, at least at steady state. And what appears to be happening is that the pseudonaut um, only shows up as the ribosome is getting close to it. It transiently refolds into this knot and then pauses the ribosome. And that may be in a, a strategy that the virus is using to not expose this fold to RNA immune mechanisms uh, uh, and to only show the functional fold when it's needed to, to carry out its function. We do believe that this is the functional fold because an independent um, cryo-EM analysis by an advanced group working with the Atkins lab um, trapped this frame shift stimulation element on a mammalian ribosome and they got a, the same three helix fold here now paused on the, the small ribosomal subunit itself. Okay, so now we've been published the structure early on and uh, we've been interacting with various groups um, to see if small molecules might be designed to bind against it. So, so far there actually hasn't, uh, has not been success. There have been screens that have found small molecules um, that affect this frame shift stimulation process, but so far none of them have bound the structure. It's going to be an exciting opportunity for us and the rest of the field to see if we can start using these structures to guide de novo drug design. 
what we did end up doing is through the functional insight that there's that that knotted uh, strand um, in um, uh, in the uh, at the five prime end of the RNA, we started designing antisense oligonucleotides, so other pieces of DNA and RNA that might come and disrupt the fold. And we are pleased to see that uh, the ones that are shown in green at the bottom of this bar chart, they do knock down viral replication by uh, one to two logs. And cocktails of these um, appear to be uh, effective against um, against SARS-CoV-2. So this kind of work, along with oligos that are uh, um, targeting the rest of the SARS-CoV-2 genome are getting actively pushed forward through a pandemic preparedness center that's set up here at Stanford and that is uh, funded through the federal government. Okay, so my favorite part of the story is unpublished. Um, uh, I alluded to the fact that we we're looking at lots of different windows of the sars coronavirus 2 genome. And it was a great shock to us that essentially every window that we looked at that was conserved resolves into a three-dimensional map and, you know, and different kinds of maps. So like X's and Y's and T's and L's, and I'm showing you here a little a gallery of these. They didn't all go to high resolution. Um, but what we've been doing is taking these regions and we find that as we truncate out bits that are modeled as unstructured, uh, we can get to higher and higher resolution. And some of these structures that we're now about, about to, to, to put out where you can really make out all the helices. Um, most <laughs> puzzling is we don't know what most of these are doing. So some of these may be affecting, again, translation by the ribosome, like a anxious stimulation element. We think maybe some of these are decoys for the native immune response. They may trap the proteins in our cells that are trying to find the viral RNA. And there's evidence for these kind of decoys and other viral RNA systems. Um, some of these may be patching signals that um, for the, the virus uses to um, selectively package its own RNA into its nucleocapsid protein as opposed to human RNAs. But we don't know, and there may be the, the functions of these we, we, we don't know. But as we're starting to get to higher resolution structures, some cases we're seeing homology to, for example, translation elements in other viruses, which is giving hints out to these structures. And so this to me is really tantalizing. Um, and we, uh, what if as we are applying the ribosome pipeline to this genome, other viral genomes or the human transcriptome, like imagine that, um, okay, there's how many, how many protein structures are there in the human body? Maybe tens of thousands. Um, uh, what if every RNA molecule in the body, and there's hundreds of thousands of those, what if every RNA molecule has at least one interesting complex 3D fold domain? It's possible that the majority of, of interesting biological structures out there are, are RNA structures rather than protein structures, and we haven't noticed because we haven't had a method yet to go find them. So I think that's a tantalizing possibility that the RNA world may soon get filled up with lots and lots of 3D structures, and we hope that these techniques will help. So what I've told you here is I've told you about a uh, largely experimental or hybrid computational experimental pipeline called the ribosome pipeline, which accelerates the determination of 3D structures using cryo-EM, a sequencing-based method to get secondary structures, and uh, computer modeling in the form of this Rosetta drafter method. I've told you about how we applied ribosome to the sars coronavirus genome, and actually within a few weeks, we we're able to, to discover a novel structure in that genome. And um, I've, I hope that you're, um, you find it as tantalizing as I do, that there appear to be 3D RNA structures potentially everywhere. Um, and uh, we now have potentially tools to go and, and resolve them. Of course, the ultimate tool that would let us uh, quickly scan genomes and find novel structures would be something like an alpha fold that we have for proteins. And I'm often asked, you know, when are we going to get to an alpha fold for RNA? There aren't enough RNA 3D structures. What's, what's it going to take? But rather than speculate about that, I'm going to pick up on a theme that from John Jumper's talk, where John said the most important thing for machine learning is uh, actually not the data, but the evaluation. And so as of this year, uh, uh, CAS 15 occurred this summer. And for the first time, it had an actual RNA category. And um, historically, uh, uh, the RNA puzzles involve you know, 10 predictors, um, maybe one target at a time for one or two targets per year. In CASP, just in a short period, there were 12 targets of really interesting um, uh, RNAs um, and 40 predictors. So a fourfold increase in the number of, of predictors for RNA took part in CASP. And, um, and I'm helping uh, a bit with the assessment and uh, we're gonna have the results announced later this year. So on December 13th, I think we'll we'll be able to answer the question of how close we are uh, to an alpha fold for RNA. Um, and so uh, I guess we'll stay tuned for that. Let me end by thanking the folks who, who um, have innovated here. Um, 
the folks who developed ribosol are Callie Capel, who did actually not just the biochemistry um, for developing RNA-only cryogen, but also the autodraft Rosetta method. She's uh, she's actually a computational biologist by, by training. Uh, the cryoEM there was pioneered by Zhao Ming Su and Kai Ming Zhang. Uh, they both have their own labs in um, in, um, in China now. Cali's at the Broad Institute, and Watchu has been an incredible collaborator throughout this entire process. When the pandemic began, Kai Ming um, stayed on at Stanford and recruited Rachel Hagee as a virologist and Vanya Zeldev, a biochemist in my lab, to go and tackle these SARS-CoV-2 RNA structures. They recruited an entire team of about 30 or 40 people from all around Stanford and Harvard, showing some of the, those folks here on the right. Um, uh, we also had great help from Ralph Barrett and Tim Sheehan at UNC, who are world famous coronavirologists. We also had help from Paul Berg, who many of you know. Um, he kind of came out of retirement and attended our group meetings to provide critical advice and um, in getting us set up to target, uh, to find targets in the RNA genome. The funding sources are shown down here below. And uh, just to finally end, I, um, for those of you out there who are looking for the, who are training in biophysics and are looking for the, your next step, uh, we at Stanford are recruiting PhD students in the biophysics program. We're recruiting postdocs and also uh, research scientists who are really interested in RNA AI or RNA cryoEM. I didn't have time to tell you about a game that we uh, lead called Eterna, but we're also looking for game developers. And uh, just email me if you're interested. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, microphone over there, please. Thank you, Azul. It should be on there. <laughs> Um, can you, I'm not sure, uh, if you can hear me, Rajan? I can, yes, I can. Oh, okay, good, good. Sorry, I, I for some reason thought you couldn't. Um, really, really exciting talk. Really enjoyed it. So, so you made it look so easy. Um, well, we really have the frozen <laughs> RNA structures deposited in the PDB next year, or if not, why not? Like, what, what are the big obstacles to... To really, because I, I was curious and I looked at the PDB statistics and there were something like 100 models yeah. deposited in the last year. What would it really take to have 10x or more of that? Is it just like everyone catching up to the work or are there still other big obstacles? Yeah, there's, there's two things on the on the RNA, particularly the RNA only structures. Yeah, one is just the number of people who are comfortable with RNA. I mean, so, you know, I, uh, with RNA vaccines and, and RNA viruses becoming hot topics in the last couple of years, you know, before that, you know, my uh, my parents didn't know what RNA was, right? You know, it was, it was uh, a pretty esoteric field. And now there's a huge actually demand uh, for RNA biologists and structural biologists. Um, and there aren't enough people who are trained. So I think there's that's part of the catch up is just, just humans who are comfortable thinking about RNA and preparing it. It's actually really easy to make these RNA molecules. Um, uh, so I think the second thing that's needed for catch up is um, uh, so if you take an entire coronavirus genome and, and put it on grids, you're not going to release, be able to make out, you know, like 3D domains, at least when we've tried it, we haven't been able to do that. Maybe that'll happen with cryo-ET, um, and with the right kind of computational methods. So there is a bit of trying to curate, okay, which domain should we look at, 100 to 200 nucleotide RNAs, uh, which we put onto grids and, and solve RNA structures for. And the good news is there's a list like an RFAM, um, which is developed actually uh, over near LMB at the EBI um, of potential structured RNA domains. So I think what's happening now is there's a lot of centers who are just going through that list of targets. But there's probably, if I'm right, then there's probably hundreds of thousands of other RNA domains. And it's actually an interesting bioinformatic challenge to then curate sequences that we can then go look at through cryoEM. So I think it's all going to feed through a virtuous cycle. I think as more RNA structures come out, more people are going to jump into the field. There's going to be more data for hopefully creating an alpha fold for RNA that will help us then parse out more domains. And we're just at the beginning of that, of what I hope is going to be a, a kind of a renaissance in RNA structure. Thank you. I should also say, I could be totally wrong. It could be that there aren't that many RNA 3D structures out there. So it, I think because of that, you know, if you go to an RNA conference, 95% of the talks don't show a 3D structure of the, the molecules they're looking at. Um, you know, the ones that are on CRISPR or on ribosomes, they'll typically show something. So it's also, I think the majority of people in RNA biology 
um, are not used to thinking about 3D structure and may doubt that their molecules have interesting, biologically interesting 3D structures. So there's a bit of a risk that folks are going to have to take if they jump into the RNA field. Okay. Hi, Ruju. It's David Lilly. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi, David. Um, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> good. So somebody asked a question about, you know, when, when your predicted structures are going to make it into the PDB. I have to say, one of the things yeah. that really convinced me about your methods early on was we had a structure, it was the glutamine 2 ribose switch. We couldn't solve it. Oh, yeah. And we had that, we had good diffraction, but we couldn't solve it. You modeled it, and that was good enough to do molecular replacement. That, that for me, is very convincing. Oh, thank you. That's a really kind, um, kind thing to bring up. And yeah, I, I do. Well, we'll find out. I suspect that methods are getting to the point where we can somewhat more, well, more routinely help phase crystal structures. And yeah, that's, that, that also for me was, it was an amazing collaboration to see and to see that happen. Yeah. yeah once you start getting structures to the point where you can phase the diffraction data, it feels real. 